my name is Lou Castaldo, and I was born in uh, 1946 in a little town called Cavasso Nuovo in Friuli. I left for Canada in 1954 and arrived here in Toronto, I believe it was uh, August the 8th or 9th of uh, 1954. As a child, you fit in very quickly. So the experiences were joyful, you know? I mean, you, you make friends quickly as a child. I did not like high school, and high school did not like me. Uh, I was not a good student. And after grade 11, I left and went to work. And I went to work in construction. The first summer I worked, um, my uncle was actually the foreman on the job, and he, that's how he got me out to go to work with him, and I was a laborer, and so there was the guys here uh, laying uh, the, the rods, the reinforcing rods, and I got along with that foreman really well, and uh, he convinced me to become, to go work with him. So then I became a rod man, and I did that for a while, but that was a really heavy, dirty job, uh, especially in the winter time. I mean, now they coat the, the steel, but then they, they didn't coat it, and in the wintertime it would sit. You would get snow on it, and it would be, rust would be on it, and you're carrying it. You had this big spool of wire around your shoulders uh, when you had to tie up the rods. And, you, and you, like you went home, you were black. It was black not from soot or anything, but it was black from uh, the iron that you were carrying around all day. And, and it was a heavy job. And, I have a bad back to prove it for the rest of my life. And I worked that full year. At the end of it, I became, I got my crane operator's license. But then I went back and did my grade 12 and 13. And then I, again, I went to work for a full year as a crane operator. And then, and then I went back to university. And I worked in instruction right from the time I was 17, every summer. When I was pouring concrete one day, there was another young summer student there, high school kid, and they said to him, bring up my coffee. So he started climbing up the tower. When he got to the cab where I was, I opened the trap door, and he was so scared, he didn't even have the strength to knock on the trap door uh, to free me to let him in. I literally had to pull him up and that sat him on the corner I said, now calm down, relax. Because the crane, when you're pouring concrete, the crane was just banging back and forth. When I finished a truckload of concrete and the crane was sitting still, and I said, now you walk down and I won't move until you're back on the ground and you wave to me that you're comfortable again. In 1972, I started working for Local 183. And as I said, we had our first contract that would date it to 1971. And, um, we started going out and servicing the membership and uh, going out to construction sites. And we'd point out things that had flaws in it. We wrote briefs to the government about expanding the, uh, the regulations around construction sites, around things falling, people being tied off. But it took years. Governments don't move quickly. Industry is like a juggernaut. It doesn't move quickly, you know. It's like you, you got this, um, this big battleship and you want it to turn, it, it takes a long time for it to turn. This was all new. And the guys really didn't support the union quite as strongly as they do today. So it was, you had to bring them along. It was like nurturing people into uh, believing that the union could do something for them. Well, I started as a, as a staff rep, or more people used to call us business agents at that time. I became the assistant manager, and I was then responsible for all the residential uh, that the local had. I was the only guy that had a degree and worked here, so because I was fluent, uh, I was involved in writing a lot of the contract language at that time uh, with the, the business manager, um, John Stefanini at the time, and so, um, did a lot of negotiations. There's two types of experiences on the bargaining committee. When you're a member of the committee, you're not the spokesman. You're waiting for breaks to talk to your spokesman to put your points across. A lot of times, um, the, the committee itself doesn't really participate 
verbally with the management committee. Sometimes you do. I mean, if something, if somebody on the other side says something that you don't, that really, that you strongly disagree with, you may interject. But typically, you do it through your spokesman. But I've also been the spokesman at bargaining committees. And things then would come through me as a spokesman and you would negotiate. Um, I recall one set of bargaining um, that I was involved in and I made the mistake of letting the, the committee uh, have a drink during dinner. And so we came back from dinner and they were full of uh, way too much energy and they did not want to settle. They thought we, the employer was just not being unreasonable and we should go out on strike. And I thought, hmm, this is not healthy. This is, this is going to get us nowhere. And so we dragged on bargaining until three o'clock in the morning. At that point, the committee was sort of mellowed out a little bit more and we were able to come to a compromise that they would support when we presented it to their membership. Yeah, that was a, a learning experience and one that I never repeated uh, again. So when you had a committee and you were going to go into the night and you went for dinner, it was uh, soda and coffee. No more, no more alcohol. By 1977, when our next contract, and we had demonstrated that we had a very good uh, benefit plan, we had a pension plan that was in place, we were out there doing, uh, settling grievances on the members' behalf, at that point, you saw th that membership turning around, being a lot more supportive uh, of what the union executive and staff were trying to accomplish, you know, uh, improving safety, improving wages, so getting them good benefits and all that, getting them hours of work that were shorter. We started shortening the workday. When we first signed them up, the workday was nine hours a day and they could make up uh, time on Saturday if they'd lost time during the, um, the week uh, before having to pay uh, overtime. Well, then in 77, we stopped that and the work week was down to eight hours a day and there was no makeup time. So if you worked on Saturday, you had to get paid overtime rate. So these are the things that we saw changes. And, and, and as again, as I said, it's a slow process. It's not something that you can do on a, uh, on a turn of a dime. Mm -hmm.